Ma'am, we are on live and we are starting this session, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. So, very good evening, doctors. I am Dr. Stalin on behalf of uh, Shield Healthcare, welcoming you all for the masterclass series on medical disorder and ERT pregnancies organized by IFS UP chapter. Today, we are having the first episode on the topic of obesity and ERT pregnancies. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mona Asani Bajaj, ma'am. Uh, Madam is going to be the today's master of ceremony for today's session. Madam is Associate Professor at uh, King's George Medical University. We welcome you, ma'am. I'm under the session to you for your further proceedings, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. A very good evening to all my respected seniors and dear friends. It's my proud privilege to welcome you all to the first episode of Masterclass C on medical disorders and ART pregnancies. First of all, I would like to invite Dr. Manjusha, ma'am, who is presently Secretary IFS UPEs to introduce us all to this fantastic program. Welcome, Manjusha, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mona, for the kind words and for welcoming everybody to this beautiful platform. Um, it is indeed my pride and privilege to be a part of this uh, masterclass series on medical disorders and ART pregnancies. And myself as Secretary, Dr. Malvika as Joint Secretary and uh, Dr. Avaida as a treasurer, I'm super duper excited to organize various academic activities under the ages of uh, UP chapter IFS. Um, now we have come to good days. In the last two years, when COVID times were, so we, uh, my effervescent predecessor, Dr. Sunita Chandra, she kept the ball rolling by uh, these webinars. And uh, we didn't have to learn from the speed of the speed. And uh, we, we could stay connected and we could all learn from each other. So that is why my patron, Dr. Chandravati Ma'am, ka idea tha ki hum log uh, is tarah ki online meetings ko continue to rakhe, uh, jisse ki hum log ek dusre ke experiences ko uh, desh ke alag alag part se uh, connect hoke, aur humai kuch viewers is samay uh, abroad bhi hain, unke saath hum log jod ke uh, ye meetings or learning ka silsila jari rakhe. Um, this particular series on medical disorders and ART pregnancies was the brainchild of our revered advisors. Uh, Dr. Veen Tadas, Madam, and Dr. Reno Makar, Madam. And um, our scientific committee has identified a list of topics which we would be discussing uh, during the next two years. And we propose to have a webinar like this every two months. And we aim to address issues which are often untouched, like pregnancy and cancer survivors, and immunological disorders, and thrombophilias, APLAs, and of course, the ever prevalent topics like uh, hypertension and diabetes. So this is what we are intending. And these webinars are going to be of interest, not just to the fertility practitioners, but also to the obstetricians who are dealing with high-risk pregnancies, especially with uh, elderly women and those with medical comorbidities. So God willing, we want to make them interesting by uh, things like quizzes, debates, and panels, in addition to the invited lectures. So I'm really, really looking forward to a great learning experience. Experience. And uh, it's really a privilege to have a galaxy of stalwarts here with us. And I'm, I'm sure that all of, our, all of our colleagues would benefit from this masterclass series. And um, we seek blessings from uh, our guru and our guiding light, uh, Dr. Chandravati Madhu. Ma'am, we can introduce her to her. We can show her to her. So I'm going to tell her to her to her to her to her. Ma'am, please, aap aashirwaad dijiye ki hum log apne venture mein kamyab ho paayin. Thank you, Manjusha. Jab hum log liye ye beech boya tha, I think hum log soch nahi paate tha ki we are going to grow so well and we'll have such lovely membership and such active people to work and take this so much forward. And I'm so pleased that Manjusha has taken over from Sunita and trying to match what she did and in fact going a step forward for maintaining the level of IFS uh, academics and uh, other things. Uh, it is really uh, a privilege to be a sort of person to be as an elder person to look after this uh, uh, UP chapter of IFS. And I'm also very proud that one of our past secretary has been taken as a 
vice president at the national level. And one of our past secretary has also become a treasurer at the national level. So I'm so very pleased because their performance has been so good that their recognition has gone even up to the national level. And I wish Manjusha and her team also to really do such wonders that in near, near future, we will be seeing them also at the national level. I wish them all the luck, all the courage, all the health and everything so that they can carry on these traditions, do wonderful webinars. And as she mentioned, she's chosen wonderful topics. And I'm so pleased to have Suchitra as the first speaker for our first master classes. And uh, I know what a wonderful orator Suchitra is, and I'm sure all of our participants, all of our viewers are really going to gain from it. Not the only IFS, I mean, infertility practitioners, but all the obstetrician also, because many times our IVF patients go to different cities, different gynae practitioners for further management, the management of pregnancy. And they don't come to IVF people only for delivery. They go to their own gynecologist, their own obstetrician for management of these pregnancies. So it will be really useful for all of them. I wish you all success. And Suchitra, thank you for being a uh, part of this and being a speaker today. Thank you, each one of you. Bless you. And I love you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, respected ma'am, for showering us with your blessings. Now we will start our program before going to scientific uh, program. We'll see we'll blessings see. from Ma Saraswati. Thank you so much. Now we will, uh, without wasting any time, we'll move forward with our scientific session. Uh, so for first session, I would like to invite our uh, chairpersons, uh, Dr. Sadhna Gupta, Madam. Madam is a renowned gynecologist and excellent academician. She is co-chair CEPOG, NCD committee, vice president COXI 2016. She has received various awards on national level. Uh, she has been organizing secretary of Abhigyan Foxy, Sefog, and BSOG conference in 2021. She has many publications in various national and international journals. Uh, welcome, ma'am. Then our second chairperson for the session is Dr. Sunita Chandra, ma'am. Ma'am is a renowned infertility expert from Lucknow. She is chairperson and director Rajendra Nagar Hospital and IVF Center. She is secretary UP chapter IFS 2020 to 22. Welcome, Sunita, ma'am. Then next year person for the session is Dr. Uma Gupta, madam. Madam is professor and head of department, Department of Ops and Gynae, DHU, Varansi. She is fellow representative AICC RCOG North Zone 2021-23. to She is principal investigation, investigator of Champion Trial, which, is, which has published in New England Journal of Medicine. So welcome, Uma, ma'am. So I welcome all the chairpersons and uh, request them to please uh, uh, conduct the session. I request Sunita ma'am to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit ma'am. She is going to speak on the topic reproductive outcome and obesity. Welcome ma'am. Thank you, Mona. Thank you so much. So a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, I have to tell you that this is UP chapter IFS, Dr. Chandravati ki hi den hai. Madam ne hi banaya tha. हमने करीब करीब 450 मेंबर बना लिए शायद उससे भी ज्यादा तो इसको दो भाग में बांट दिया गया यूपी ईस्ट एंड यूपी वेस्ट तो आप समझ सकते हैं कि मेंबरशिप हमने कितनी अच्छे से बनाई है जिसकी वजह से अब दो चैप्टर हो गए 
and now uh, manjusha is there as secretary and i'm sure she is really going to do very 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 well and we will again be there at national level uh she has actually chosen a very very uh, nice topic for all of us not for infertility specialist for all the gynecologists and obstetricians uh medical disorders in art pregnancies and uh, two scientific uh, chairpersons dr anju and dr smriti i mean nothing to say about them both of them are uh, academician par excellence it is my proud privilege to uh, introduce uh, dr suchitra pandit ma'am she is a legendary figure on her own what to say about her she is consultant department of ops and gyne surya group of hospitals mumbai she was chairperson aicc rcoz till 2020 president isopa 2018 to 20 she is uh, she was president mumbai society of ops and gyne president foxy and icog from 14 to 15 initiated foxy gestosesias ma'am we remember you for this only foxy gestosis is uh, aapki den hai hypertensive disorders in pregnancy we held gestosis uh, conference in lucknow at national level which was a very very hit uh, conference uh secretary foxy unicef sion kishori adolescent empowerment project at dharavi she has been awarded 36 orations and more than 2000 guest lectures in india and abroad uh and she has many publications to her credit let's hear from dr suchitra and pandit thank you so much uh, dr chandravati we all love her बिकॉज जस्ट उनका फेस देख के ही बहुत अच्छा लगता है शी इज देयर टू सपोर्ट एवरीबडी नॉट जस्ट इन यूपी बट ऑल ओवर द कंट्री एंड ऑफकोर्स इट्स यू नो अ ग्रेट ऑनर टू बी योर द फर्स्ट स्पीकर एंड थैंक यू सो मच एवरीबडी इन दिस इज जोन यू नो आई एफ एस हु हैव थॉट मी वर्थ टू गिव द फर्स्ट स्टॉक एंड ऑफकोर्स I have to thank my chairperson Sunita ji, Sarna ji, and of course the young uh, HOD from Banaras. So you know, wonderful to have everybody there, and of course to see Dr. Vinita. Uh, you know, we do meet at uh, conferences, but आजकल webinar पे थोड़ा सा मिलना ज़्यादा होता है. And of course uh, Manjusha and the entire team. Great to see you all. And uh, now I'm going to start sharing the screen. Am I visible? As is the screen visible? yes yeah so uh, this topic is actually a very very important topic i think uh, very wisely just a second i'm yeah so reproductive outcomes and obesity management issues and solutions is what i'm going to be talking about so just a quick fact file rapidly changing diets and lifestyles are fueling the global obesity epidemic and once obesity was considered as a problem of prosperity but now it's fast growing so much so that even in india we have such a high prevalence of undernutrition but there are significant proportions of overweight and obesity coexisting and naturally with the rising prevalence of obesity there is a profound impact on the female reproductive health i think we are all familiar familiar with how to calculate the bmi i just would like to mention that more than 25 is taken as overweight More than thirty is obese, and when you are talking of morbid obesity, it is more than forty, and more than fifty is obviously extremely morbid obesity. And general causes of obesity, I am not going to go into details, but we know that today's generation, erratic eating habits and excessive intake of the wrong kind of foods, lack of regular exercise and sleep, and basically a sedentary lifestyle, and to add on to that is PCOS. And today it is being talked about that the road to obesity and diabetes begins in utero probably if the mother has diabetes and the baby has a low birth weight these could be the causes but there are also genetic components to the problem and certain genes have been associated with the type 2 diabetes and they have been actually identified in canada and children today added on to that are less physically active so all these problems probably contribute what then happens at puberty children consume more energy than they expend there is a strong relationship between childhood obesity and then the later insulin resistance and these factors are similar to those related to obesity insulin resistance as well as uh, diabetes in adults 
And puberty is the additional factor for obesity and diabetes, which occurs in the younger students. Now, what happens is as the puberty is progressing, the glucose disposal decreases, as a result of which there is an increase in the insulin resistance. And how do adolescents meet this? They do it by increasing insulin production. And if they are genetically predisposed teens, apart from those who are already obese, the scale tips in favor of developing diabetes at a very young age. And don't we know this figure? 36% of women in India are suffering. But at the time, it was reported it is 36, but probably it's a lot more. And we all now today have understood that PCOS is just a phase, but it is an underlying complex metabolic disorder where apart from all the hyperandrogenism, central obesity, dyslipidemia, the cardiovascular complications, we are now worried about the reproductive dysfunction which occurs and of course the rise of malignancies. So obesity and PCOS is a known entity to all of us, whether it's a gynecologist, whether it's an IVA specialist, because we are seeing more and more of these girls, more of an android type of obesity, a centripetal type of weight distribution. And these girls, particularly if they have a waist circumference of more than 88 centimeters, probably they will go into an abnormal endocrine and metabolic dysfunction. And problems of obesity, we've already talked about all these macrovascular complications, but added to that is the sleep apnea, the orthopedic problems. And what we today as gynecologists are worried about is the ovulatory subfertility and ovulatory infertility, poor responders, poor fertilization rates, impaired embryos. So these poor girls, they are stigmatized not just because of the obesity, also because of infertility, they end up having depression. And this is something which we have to work at our youth level. And time and again, we've been talking about these issues. Parents, wake up and get your kids to have a regular lifestyle. Encourage physical activity, proper bowel habits, and get them to spend time with the family and make sure that the family is involved when we are talking of weight reduction. Because it is not just exercise and nutrition is the entire family performing together to help weight reduction of overall. So that means changing the lifestyle of eating in the habit in the house, reducing the saturated and the trans fat and increasing the fiber and the polyunsaturated fat. So naturally now, because there is an increasing incidence of obesity, as well as PCOS, and we've now got this figure between 1975 and 2016, the pre-pregnancy obesity in more than 20 years increased from 6 to 16% globally. And in India, this has gone up to 20%. So one in five pregnant women in Indian urban setups is obese. That's a huge figure. And the incidence to the course of ART naturally becomes higher. So what do we do now about this? Obviously, determine the degree of obesity, assess the lifestyle, talk about lifestyle changes. When required, we are in the nutritionists, the counselors, the drug management, and there are times when they even may need to do a bariatric surgery. So what are the challenges that obese women can face? Obviously, very conceptionally for getting pregnant, and then once they get pregnant, the problems of the first trimester, during pregnancy, during delivery, postpartum, the neonatal issues, and the long-term impact is what I would be talking about. So pre-pregnancy counseling, in fact, is a very, very important thing. Maximizing the interpregnancy loss if they've already had one delivery and try to reduce the weight gain in the pregnancy. So involving a dietitian and the first time they come in evaluation by a clinical psychologist and an exercise plan. But let's talk a little bit about pre-pregnancy counseling. Here again, there are actually pre-pregnancy clinics where you are doing a proper tailoring program, diet, exercises, drugs, and bariatric surgery is the last resort, of course, and continuous reinforcement. When there are obese people, they lose their motivation. So continuous re-motivation and then planning pregnancy because we all understand that obesity may there is a higher need for an ART. So typically, you know, pushing these people, motivating them is very, very essential. Why does obesity contribute to subfertility? Probably obese couples don't not able to have a proper intercourse. They take longer to conceive. Obese women require, if they have to go in for IVF, 
They require higher doses of gonadotrophins, respond poorly to ovarian stimulation, have fewer oocyte harvesting, and overall, the leptin which is there, this probably causes inhibition of the gonadotrophins and decrease estradiol production from the granulosa cells, and that is one of the major factors. Obesity, again, has got lower fertilization, poor quality embryos, higher miscarriage rates. And in the recent studies, you know, they've all confirmed that adverse effects of obesity on all the ART procedures. So what does one do? Obviously, sustained and gradual weight loss will help in the conception. And it's only when nothing works that one advises bariatric surgery. And this is probably because they are morbidly obese or they have repeatedly been failures in following any weight reduction program. Because in this case, what happens is we know that obesity confers an increased risk of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, more operative intervention. So therefore, in these patients, post-operative complications be zyada bad jate. So they may have this option of going for a bariatric surgery, particularly if there is a obesity a BMI more than 50. So the surgical procedures, again, without going into details, restrictive and restrictive malabsorptive. Either it's with an adjustable gastric band or a sleeve gastrectomy, or it's a ruin lie uh, gastric bypass, which is more popular. But today they've come up with a very nice gastric balloon, which can be put inside. It's just an ultrasound guided balloon, which is put inside and it is kept in the abdomen. And this is inflated and the patient has the, you know, the power to reduce or increase the size and this way she can control it. Of course, this is under investigation. And uh, now we'll know a lot more about it later. But generally, anyone who's done a gastric uh, bypass, they must be advised not to conceive immediately because in the first 18 months, probably there may be a fetal rapid fetal loss and we don't want to have a pregnancy immediately. And of course, you don't want to delay too much because these women are getting older and consensus suggests that at least wait for 12 to 18 months after a bariatric surgery to minimize complications from nutrition deficiencies and promote an optimal and a stable return loss. And obviously, they then have to be followed up very, very carefully. Remember, friends, obesity is a state of chronic low-grade inflammation. And when you're combining it with pregnancy, pregnancy is a state of altered immunity. So the two together lead to this chronic inflammatory response, which sets off a cascade of events which may harm the mother and fetus and cause the gestosis problems of GDM, hypertension, medically indicated preterm deliveries and operative intervention. And therefore, the therapeutic approaches, which we are talking about the pre-pregnancy weight loss is much more better. But if the patient gets pregnant, then you have to decide what to do. So the first visit itself, a detailed history, ask for all the medical problems. And don't forget to check, is it an ERT conception? Are they on progestogen? What is exactly their history? What about their diet? What about their lifestyle? Any addictions? What is their home support? And quickly, when you've done that, the important test is calculate the BMI, evaluate the cardiovascular problems, the dental and the overall hygiene, the gestosis score, because if the gestosis score is more than three, start off low dose aspirin, even before they've gone for the nuchal scans and advise routine investigation and a glucose challenge test. Gestosis score, again, without going into details, it is maternal factors and certain important history factors. And the factors on the left side will give a score of one. The factors on the right side will give a score of two. And of course, if the patients have had pre-gestational diabetes mellitus or have had any of the thrombophilias or an ERT pregnancy, which is excluding IUI, they get a score of three. So if the score of three or more, we start off with low-dose aspirin because this helps in reducing the incidence of preeclampsia. And obviously, why is weight so important? You know, the IOM has given certain characteristics, how much the weight should increase. So repeated weighing during the pregnancy should be confined to circumstances that may influence the clinical management. But you have to advise about the appropriate weight gain and take a very positive and a respectful as well as a supportive approach because these patients are very, very sensitive. So if they are overweight women, they should gain between 6.8 to 11.3. And if the BMI is more than 30, they should gain maximum up to 9 kgs. And maybe lesser the weight gain, the better it is. 
And obviously, we are worried because the first trimester pregnancy losses are high. Studies have shown that there is a recurrent uh, spontaneous abortions are commoner in obese patients as compared to the normal patients. And probably what could be happening is in the obese patients, there is an impaired folliculogenesis and a poor quality of oocytes. So whether they conceive spontaneously or whether they have ovulation induction, probably that is contributing um, to the risk of spontaneous abortions. Again, the incidence of congenital anomalies is higher relative folate deficiency, higher rates of undiagnosed type 2 DM, and later diagnosis of severe anomalies may increase the, in, you know, in the birth prevalence. And these are some of the anomalies. Cardiovascular is the most common as the neural tube defects. The macrosomia is leading to shoulder dystocia, stillbirth, which we are all dreading, and of course, childhood obesity, which is on the rise. So what can we really do? What are the changes that we have to do in the clinic? Training the staff to be much more receptive and sensitive to different needs. Planning a comfortable seating arrangement. Kafi bar bedne ke liye sahi kursi nahi rehta. So having an adequate couch for examination it is difficult to check the fetal heart with the Dopplers. So kafi bar, what you have to do is you have to use a ultrasound to check the fetal heart. Fundal heights are also difficult to obtain. So naturally there is more ultrasound happening in these people. Every time. Check the BP, but have a separate blood pressure cuff because you can go wrong. If obese women are there, you cannot check the BP correctly. So have an appropriate cuff. Even ultrasound may be a challenge because they may be uncomfortable. Now, what about patients who are undergoing, uh, you know, antenatal checkups if they've had a bariatric surgery? You know, make sure that you have a nutritionist consultation because they must have balance of proteins, iron, folates, vitamin B12 and they have to have supplements of all of these including what they eat so small frequent meals uh, frequent antiemetics and they have separate consumptions of solid liquids the incidence of hyperemesis is higher they have to chew well and they have to stop when they feel full so very strict antipartum surveillance for preeclampsia gdm and fetal growth restrictions so when you're dealing with them we must remember that their emotional distress is also very high Often, this has been reported, and I've seen this myself, that obese and overweight women experience a negative interaction. They don't want to come in the busy OPD. They come later. So call them last or call them right in the beginning. They constantly have that psychological and emotional distress. Therefore, service providers have to be very, very sensitive. And we try to give them the positive reinforcement of whatever advice. So some of the complications, as we know, we've already talked about the hypertension, diabetes, the preterm delivery. We are extremely concerned about stillbirths, and we'll talk about it just a little later. But what I'd like to say that groin infections, so maintaining hygiene, vaginal candidiasis, UTIs, gallbladder disease, and DVTs because of a sedentary lifestyle are also common. And these women have obstructive sleep apnea. So referring them to the sleep clinic to get them onto the correct gadget so that they can sleep better. Carpal tunnel syndrome. We are also worried about DVTs, as I've already mentioned. And get them evaluated by an anesthetist in time because complications of anesthesia are also high. GDM, I think we all understand. And this, the, how can we control it? We've been talking so much about this correct diet, medical nutritional therapy, but where required, they need their uh, metformins and they need insulins. So if you can manage it yourself well, others get a diabetologist involved. We also understand the incidence of diabetes and the irregular management contributes to the stillbirth. So joint consultation with, you know, these are diabetic joint uh, clinics with the obstetricians, regular exercises, walking, maintaining records of sugar level, frequently calling them and don't forget to do the fetal echocardiography friends when you're doing the sonographies so a fetal medicine person could do a good job and plan the place more than optimal timing for delivery so that they have adequate neonatal intensive care facility the hypertension we know either they may be pre-existing hypertensive or they may get pregnant and have hypertension so it could be a you know a gestational hypertension or a superimposed and the incidence of preeclampsia is also very very high so clear and close monitoring is very essential and the appropriate antihypertensives should be given to them again preterm delivery does it really happen because they're obese well majority of the times they could be going into PPROMs because of the vaginal infection or the bacterial vaginosis. 
but also sometimes there is an iatrogenic preterm delivery because of the hypertension or the diabetes where you have to intervene and both these types are very common in the obese patients and you want to protect the anomalies and therefore you are also thinking of how to prevent the stillbirth now we understand that maternal overweight and obesity are the one that contributes to the stillbirth but what has also been found that along with this the rising age and if the patient has been a smoker these also can lead to micro and macro complications and they can lead to stillbirth and there can be a sudden fetal loss so be very very careful the babies tend to get larger if the sugars are not well controlled and obviously maternal obesity predisposes to increased size babies increase adipose tissues particularly in the fetal abdomen and that is why you get that shoulder dystocia and we are it's a nightmare if you've had a patient like that but what are the other problems that can occur uncomfortable positioning during delivery because we don't have proper appropriate bariatric tables reduced vaginal space in case of trial labor so pv karna bhi mushkil rehta hai difficulty in assessing the cervix and if they deliver it's a dysfunctional labor shoulder dystocia third to fourth degree tears again if there is a shoulder dystocia giving that macro opus position is difficult and always that sort of pph is there so therefore people tend to go more and more into cesarean sections and then you are always concerned consider considering the anesthetic complications so these are some of the complications which arise as your bmi is going higher and higher and therefore one thing you have to plan is what is the place of birth what is the timing and what is the mode obviously low risk units will always transfer the morbid obese patients the tertiary care you have to accept these patients come what may and sometimes this causes a lot of distress to the lady and her family so pehle se hi unko counsel karke rakh de ki we are going to be sending you away and what are the possible birth interventions should you be waiting for the onset of labor or should you induce labor should you do an emergency section or should you do an elective these are the questions which always are there but remember i've already mentioned about why the interventions of c section are higher because you're always worried about the monitoring challenges whether they are larger babies they are with their iugrs there's a less efficient uterine activity so therefore better to plan if you're planning a c section also even a bigger hospital you may have only one bariatric table so therefore you have to have an additional one for an emergency this is what a bariatric table looks like you have to have even bigger wheelchairs bigger trolleys even sighting and i mean maybe a challenge and getting the patient on to the table they have the chair lifts challenges even in the ot table and surgeries can also be technically more challenging for them what about anesthesia uh here again identifying the subdural and epidural space is difficult so having an experienced anesthetist they may be taking a longer time there is more chances of a postural puncture headache and you don't want to do a ga because they have a short neck and they can be problems of intubation so therefore friends in bigger hospitals you have facilities of bigger birthing beds a bigger team of anesthetists who have different kinds of instruments and that's why these should patients should be dealt with in the tertiary care uh, when i was working at mani we did have all these things but yet when there was an emergency and the bariatric table was occupied for bariatric surgery we were again in soup and if they are on the standard tables you have to have two people supporting them because they are really quite big now again in a c section there are challenges because there's a large anus you taking an incision you'll have to have somebody to hold up that abdominal wall to reach the lower segment it is unformed it's a tricky combination more time is required and after the delivery keep a subcutaneous drain high rate of wound complications after surgery but even during the surgery friends we have to be very careful that you want to do it in time and not prolong because the incidence of dvt is also higher here again we found that the incidence of uh, uh, in had a bariatric surgery doesn't necessarily mean that just because they've had a surgery they should have a c section but here in the incidence of growth restriction is much more higher maternal anxiety levels are very very high and you take a decision depending upon what the obstetric indication is there is no indication of a c section over here because the patients have already lost weight they are still obese at delivery and they've conceived much more earlier then obviously then you have 
decide what you have to do because it is the C-section and the obesity which will put them at risk and not the history of bariatric surgery. So therefore, early referral to a tertiary unit is much more better. Planning the delivery with a team, multidisciplinary team should be available and there should be a facility for neonatology because quite often these babies have respiratory distress syndrome, they have, uh, you know, the sugar levels tend to fall down and these need to be monitored very nicely in the NICUs and women have to be counseled about this particular thing. Should you give them steroids? Yes, obviously, if you intervene a little early, you can give them a shot of steroids to enhance lung maturity. But remember when the birth outcomes are going to be adverse if the BMI is more than 40 and the incidence of c sections will be much more higher. We've already talked about the fetal and the neonatal complications, but another thing that comes in is meconium aspiration and neonatal death. So the incidence of neonatal death is also higher once the BMI goes more than 40. What about post-delivery? Obviously, if these patients have delivered normally, great, but if they've had a C-section, try to get them to mobile, move as soon as possible. Give them thromboprophylaxis in the form of dead stockings, low molecular weight, heparin, six hours, post-spinal, and give them flotrons because at least these will keep them moving. Lactation is not so easy. The breastfeeding gets delayed initiation. And all these women will require special lactational management because even holding the baby may be very difficult for them. And they have a lot of negativity because they're not able to feed. So the postpartum blues, anxiety, depression are very high. And even after discharge, the family has to be counseled to watch out for this. What happens to the children once they're born to obese mothers? These are twice as likely to be obese and develop type 2 diabetes. As the maternal BMI rises, probably there is more adipose tissue and this is related, this contributes to the hepatic lipid content and this initiates the program of, you know, the fetal programming of metabolic syndrome in utero. All these girls, if they are, they tend to have an earlier menarche and therefore we as obstetricians have to stop this fetal programming and we have to start talking about pre-pregnancy counseling your resources are much more uh, utilized because of larger hospital stays and more uh, ultrasounds, more medications, maintenance of hygiene. But coming to the last two slides, uh, lifestyle changes, counseling, calling them frequently antenatally and even postnatally, even post-delivery of proper dietitian advice, encourage them to start walking and be active, move and eat less, but eat well, means eat a proper kind of a high protein diet, taking care of the maternal, emotional health and lifestyle changes. Sleep apnea is very, very common post delivery and hypertension, diabetes is also on the cards. And don't forget to talk to them about contraception. Of course, we talk to them a little later once they've delivered and once all that full drama of, you know, the, uh, the excitement is all over. Then you talk to them about contraception. IUDs, POPs, not planned is a very good method in these particular women because even putting in an IUD is not exactly easy and they may forget to take the POP. So not plant is a good device to put in. And in case of a future pregnancy, preconception counseling. So, Friends, uh, there is a lot more to obesity in pregnancy and reproductive outcomes, but we understand that if we start from the adolescent age itself, eat less and do more, that will help us a lot. Many women take pride that my child is so healthy hai, and the weight is so much higher, but itna se adult ke jaisa khata hai, but then you realize they're eating a lot more. So we can start right in the beginning so that when they come to the reproductive age group, they don't have to keep going in for IVF and we can monitor them much more better during pregnancy. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for calling me for this prestigious, uh, you know, opening uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, respected Suchitra ma'am for enlightening us on such an important yet overlooked topic. Uh, now I would request Uma Gupta madam to summarize the talk. My name is not Uma Gupta. So sorry, ma'am. Uma Gupta, madam, is in Lucknow and I'm from Varanasi. <laughs> so sorry, ma'am. I'm Uma Pandey. Thank you. So um, um, uh, what I would like to say that this was a brilliant lecture on um, uh, obesity. 
which is started from right from the beginning of uh, how little children uh, they, they eat, they behave, how extra calories they eat, and how our parents, they feel very nice um, that, um, uh, that the that children are uh, overeating and they are healthy. A chubby child uh, is, is considered to be a healthy child. Unfortunately, that may not be true. And uh, that carries on with, with during the being the toddler, then they carry on to the being teenager, then they carry on to, to their reproductive age groups. And that has repercussions right throughout the, their period. So, uh, right, Madam has also described how if you do not have one bariatric bed in your institution, then you, you should, ideally you should have two. I remember very well when I was in Hull, there was a child who was a uh, well, teenager, 17 years old, and he was uh, he weighed 132 kilograms. So he was not well. He had pneumonia, lung infection, all that things he had. He was brought into the hospital accident and emergency department by fire, uh, these fire brigade guys. So they brought him. And they brought him, and because there was no bed in that, in, in that accident and emergency, they had to put him on the ground. Because that uh, teenager was on the ground, that teenager could not be given proper treatment. And therefore, very, very unfortunately, he died within six hours of admission or arrival, should I say. So uh, th that problem, uh, being obese, is a lot worse in the Western countries, but we are not far behind. Sometimes I sit at the airport and I just watch how many people are obese in our country. Honestly, I do that. So we are not far behind. We are eating all the Western food. We are not doing exercise. I also don't do exercise, to be honest with you. So that is going really in uh, towards the bad side. So as far as when women is concerned, obviously we have, it is said that women has always more of a responsibility than men. Uh, so when the reproduction is concerned, it becomes more of an issue. Uh, I've seen so many women with obesity in which the cesarean has, is, is a nightmare. And listening for the fetal heart is a nightmare. So you cannot conduct the labor properly because you cannot hear their fetal heart. The CTG machine wouldn't do that. The NST wouldn't do that. So then you end up performing cesarean section. In that situation, when you do the flap of the abdomen, upper abdomen wouldn't stay. And sometimes we put alice and we tie it up towards the anesthetic side. So it's difficult, but we should be respectful to the people who are obese. Many a times it's not their fault. So many a times, I mean, reflexly, I even sometimes I say, Vajan ghata ke aye, tab hum hysterectomy karenge. Vajan ghata ke aye, to aapka uh, periods bhi behtar ho jayega. Aapka PCO bhi behtar ho jayega. Lekin wo bahut achha statement nahi hai. Mujhe bhi nahi bolna chahiye. Aur uh, hume thoda samman karna chahiye un logon ka ki thik hai, wo mote to hai. Lekin zaruri nahi hai ki wo unhi ki galti hai. We should be sympathetic, empathetic towards their obesity and try to handle it as best as we can. That's what I feel about the city, actually. So uh, I'm going to like what, what uh, Manjula says. So it was a master stroke from a master. Uh, need to listen. And um, I was always introspecting that what is actually happening and the, the epidemic of PCOs, epidemic of obesity. And what we say around 20 years ago when we were on abroad, I used to see, oh my God, we are very lucky we don't see that obesity in our country. Still, we don't see that morbid obesity in our country, but still uh, now we see here and there. So actually, uh, with the no obstetrician and gynecologist, and I think no doctor want a obese patient as a as if, as if to deal with infertility, to deal with pregnancy. Uh, but as a professional community, we have leaders like Dr. Chandravati. All leaders are there, Dr. Suchitra Pandey, Dr. Geeta. Everybody is there. And uh, it is a question that actually what we are presenting to them. So once one army society where there is no working place, uh, we are encouraging too much of coaching class and the pressure on children and adolescents. Uh, we do adolescent program and what teachers and principals say, please, please tell us this, because mommy, mothers, people don't give food or food, they give Maggi and chips. So, 
जनरेशन पूरी जो मदर बन चुकी है दे आर कमिंग विद दिस दैट द वुमेन आर नॉट टेकिंग दैट इंटरेस्ट इन कुकिंग एंड इट इज कंसिडर्ड मे बी वुमेन एम्पावरमेंट बिकॉज वुमेन आर ऑक्यूपाइंग गुड प्लेसेज एंड दे आर अर्निंग बट दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दैट वॉट सोसाइटी वी हैव नो प्ले लाइक इन आवर प्लान देर इज नथिंग टू वॉक नथिंग टू प्ले and in our homes what is happening one is this thing that uh, we are not focusing once upon a time we were too much focused on food now we are eating too much but we are not focusing ki wo khana kya kha raha hai aur kis tarah se kya raha hai jaise like we always say dhyan se khao but when we jab hum dhyan se khate hain to hum kam khate hain khushi se khate hain and that is a quality in everything what we say so actually as a professional organization we have to see that why we are dealing with so much of obesity so much of pcs so much of metabolic disorder and we have to do something like like we can say no celebrity says like sales the cold drinks and the food and we have the smaller portion of the food and we have the healthier diets in the uh, our own airport and the traveling thing so there is a lot of thing to say and what dr suchitra says very very nicely very very precisely right from reproduction to the postpartum care and all over the life and all new concept in pco says they come to one point that is dogma theory says it is a quality of diet uh, chronic stress theory says it is the your diet when we have the high glucose diet then we it is a chronic inflammatory stress and then environmental toxin we are really switching to package food now we don't make any sort of papad and anything in our home we are switching uh, willingly or unwillingly to package food and the hydrogenated oil and we are going to environmental toxic so all new research actually questioning yes we are too much uh, like uh, have high technology we have good hospital but not necessarily the every like the people really approach that kind of hospital like we have the two bariatric table we don't have even one bariatric table uh, and the most of the obstetrician and gynecologists will say that we don't have that bigger size of cuff and bigger size of wheelchair for most of our hospital so our key if we really want to have our key is in prevention and we have to go at the work at many many level right from uh, Uh, at like from it should be because media everything is focusing we are having mobile classes we are we are pushing children to do not to work and then we say uh, uh, that you do this thing so they are added on mental stress mental stress mental stress so as a thoughtful person and a leader and all august audience we really have to see that how can we prevent because like obese women like obese person who is a rich Uh, maybe socio economic state and we have complication then we have more medical legal issue we have more issues with uh, the women maybe the like the low socio economic or the medium class cannot say so it is a vicious circle and uh, as a professional organization as a very very like a leaders we have to be working on the adlo said we have to be working in utro we have to be working with media and we have to be working with celebrity so it is a multi pronged affair and hope that the future india is healthy india fit india and human body is made for physical work no mental work can substitute physical work we are made for doing physical work and we have to inculcate that thing in new generation aapko paudhon mein pani डालना है आपको नेचर से कनेक्ट रखना है आपको घर का काम करना है इट इज नॉट गोइंग टू जिम इज नॉट द थिंग वी हैव टू डू अवर डेली कोर्स एंड दैट मेक्स यू फिट सो सम डिसिप्लिन सम चेंज ऑफ थॉट and as a doctors we can be a real real game changer if we are clear in our mind thank you once again uh, dr sunita dr manjusha everybody for this invite and thank you it was treat to listen dr suchitra pandit always and my deep regards to dr chandravati madam dr vinita das who uh, we always have the blessings and for them and they are re- always with us for their guidance and the blessing so it is real real pleasure to have you thank you very much for opportunity to express my thought thank you sadha suchitra wonderful talk very good lovely mai baithi rahi tumhare liye thank you sadha wonderful thank you so much sadha ma'am uma ma'am for your expert comments ma'am 
uh, now our audience is also keen to ask few questions so ma'am can we take few questions here sure so uh, ma'am actually first question is is there any role of elective cesarean section in these obese women where uh, continuous electronic fetal monitoring is not available so if we cannot monitor the fetal heart can we go for a straight forward can we write the indication like this that uh, we cannot hear fetal heart and cannot monitor the labor no it's not just it's not just one thing that you cannot monitor there are so many other factors see if somebody is just having a 25 or a 26 she is just overweight but i'm talking of morbid obesity you know someone who got more than 35 bmi that means weighing 104 100 you know 20 kg the, those are the patients where you know you have a problem in even doing an internal examination those are the problems there is dysfunction labor and there you cannot measure the fetal heart simple obesity means just the standard you know bmi class 1 obesity you are able to measure the fetal heart those are those cannot be the indication then you have to have ob obstetric indication for doing a section but in i'm talking about the morbid obesity the morbid obesity where the bmi is more than 35 or 40 those are the ones you yeah you but there again obesity could be an indication because you are worried about shoulder dystocia there is no space available thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am uh, now uh, actually ma'am i also want to ask a question ma'am ma'am uh, we heard that congenital anomalies are also common in these obese women so ma'am is there any direct mechanism or is it due to diabetes only because uh, uh, incidence of diabetes is more or uh, we are not able to diagnose prenatally the congenital anomalies and uh, we cannot terminate the pregnancies like that let's see currently what they are saying is a relative folate deficiency because in very obese women uh, the dose that we are giving is probably insufficient second thing is some of them are not able to change you know we give the standard folic acid preparation so we probably need to give the more the advanced folic acid preparation where directly you know the derivative is available instead of giving just a simple plate plate second thing is we actually you know many of these obese women they are following up early with your pre pregnancy you will start them on folic three months prior yahan pe kya hota hai patients pregnant kar ho ke aa jate hain they are already 8 weeks pregnant so that time where they could have had a preconception of folic acid is lost because 8 weeks ke baad aate hain that is why that pre pregnancy counseling is very important second is uh, today you are able to diagnose a lot of uh, uh, fetal anomalies uh, because you got excellent uh, fetal medicine people my advice to all people who have got ultrasound machine in the nursing homes you do your ultrasounds no problem but get yourself trained for the nuchal scan the first trimester scan we are looking at a lot of things apart from just the neck and you know the nd and the heart but you're also looking at the dopplers and you're doing an advanced you know it's known as the advanced uh, uh, dual marker study where you're also looking at the pre eclampsia risk you're looking at the risk of diabetes you're looking at the pape levels so you'll get a lot more details and then the anomaly scan where we are doing it 1920 but the echocardiography if it's done by a fetal medicine person or someone who's trained in fetal ultrasound they can pick up the nuances at 20 to 21 weeks but the ideal time if they are not able to do it then is 22 weeks but fortunately because mtp act has changed up to 24 weeks with a single doctor you can still terminate the pregnancy but what people can miss is the spina you know the caudal regression syndrome so there somebody has to very clearly look out tap that entire spinal cord right up to the end and they have to look at it and even when people say you know still birth ho gaya but in diabetes undiagnosed diabetes we know that the sugars are going high pata hi nahi chalta unko so one very good intervention which we can do is start doing the glucose challenge test right in the first trimester be tight the medical nutrition therapy pehle se bol ke rakho meetha mat khao small frequent meals walk for 10 minutes after every meals regular activity do your household work because then only you can keep your metabolism in control and kafi sara in logon ka na pre existing hypertension rehta hai so first trimester mein wo pata hi nahi chalta and then suddenly in the second trimester it's much more higher and i i mentioned to you about the gestosis score so gestosis score mein obesity also gets a uh, one mark and plus uh, the pcos also gets one mark and plus the interpregnancy interval so if the gestosis score is 3 and above 
just start them on 75 milligrams of low dose aspirin at and it is to be taken at 8, 8 p.m. in the night. And if they do a first time is to scan, of course, they will tell you after doing the scan and the dual marker that probably the ratio is very high for getting a preeclamp. So then from 75, you can change over to one. So these are some of the precautionary measures which you can do. Or patient But you have to give them the alternatives. That is why that nutritionist makes a lot of difference. In the UK diabetic clinics, they used to have joint consultation the diabetologist and the obstetrician and they used to be a nutritionist and they had a kitchen so kitchen may not even asian sabse zyada diabetes asian women ko rehta tha so wo asian women ko actually batate what recipes can you cook so similarly you know somebody can come out with wonderful recipes simple recipes which are nutrition nutritious they have their proteins they have their calcium but less of fat our indian khana acha rehta hai but kafi north ki taraf kafi tel rehta hai khane mein so, you know, that is something which they can reduce. So talk to them about in, including more of proteins, more of fruits, more of green veggies. This change in adolescence. So our dietary habits will And fasting. Karvachaudhi pregnancy mein patients karti, even the Muslim ladies, uh, Rosas, and even the other Hindus also do their uh, fasting. So wo fasting, particularly obesity, mein to bilkul hi nahi Thank you so much, ma'am, for clarifying our uh, query so nicely, ma'am. Uh, is there any other query? May, may I ask? Uh, I, uh, I don't think that we have any query. So thank you so much, ma'am. We'll move forward to our next session. Thank you very much. That is a, a panel discussion. So this for this, I would uh, like to invite our moderators for the panel discussion. I would like to invite respected Anju Agrawal Madam. Madam is Vice Dean Academics and Professor Ops and Gaini KGMU Lucknow. She has more than 100 publications to her name in uh, national and international journals. She is winner of various prestigious awards. She has held various significant posts in various societies like Chairperson North Zone ISOPAP 18 to 20, President Lucknow Chapter ISOPAP 17 to 19. Welcome Anju ma'am. Welcome for the uh, panel discussion. Then our co-moderator, Dr. Smriti Arwal, Madam. Ma'am is Professor and Head of Department, Department of Ops and Gaini, RML Institute of Medical Sciences. She's recipient of Professor Dhan Dhavendra Kumar, Young Investigator Gold Medal from KGMU. She's member of core group of revised Revi Revi CMONG curriculum and expert group on formulating guidelines in medical disorders in pregnancy and genital tuberculosis. She has held the position of Joint Secretary AICOG 2020 in LOGS 20 to 2022. Uh, welcome, Smriti ma'am. Now, uh, I would uh, uh, request Smriti ma'am to carry forward this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Mona. And it is my privilege to uh, introduce our two experts for the panel discussion today. First is none other than Professor Vinita Das, who has been head of the department, Dean uh, Faculty of Medicine in KGMU for 20 years. She was instrumental in renovating our IVF lab and re-establishing it with a state-of-art lab and uh, OT. At present, she is consultant and advisor in Birla Fertility and IVF Center, Lucknow. She is vice president-elect for ISOPAP. She's founder president of Lucknow chapter ISOPA. She has done the IMSP fellowship in high-risk pregnancy from USA. She has been past president blogs. She has initiated PPIUCD and UP, which got upscaled to the whole of the country, has received various international fellowships, PIGO and FOXY awards, received the DIPSI national award for GDM guidelines, worked with Ministry of Health GOI and has been team leader for various national guidelines for labor and delivery. And she has more than 150 publications in various national and international journals and more than 80 research projects. So welcome, ma'am. And we really look forward to having you as an expert. Our second expert is Dr. Minakshi Sood. Uh, she is an uh, alumnus of KGMC Lucknow. She's a life member of IMA and she's a leading practitioner of Aligarh. 
She is also a life member of IMA Foxy, UPCOG, ISOPAB West, SCBI, Vice President, Past Secretary, Aligarh Ops and Gynes Society, and her special areas of interest are adolescent health and high risk obstetrics. Welcome, Minakshi Ji. And I request Dr. Smriti to introduce our, our eminent panelists also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anju. Uh, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our esteemed panelists for today. And we have with us uh, Dr. Uh, Divya Agarwal. Dr. Divya is from Varanasi. She was the past president of the Varanasi Obs and Gynes Society. Um, she is a gold medalist and has also done her fellowship in reproductive medicine in Germany. Uh, we have uh, next panelist, uh, Dr. Ekika. Dr. Ekika is a fertility consultant from Mau and uh, she is an ardent researcher. We recently had the privilege of reading one of her papers which have been recently published. Uh, we have next uh, uh, Dr. Pallavi Dhawan. Dr. Pallavi Dhawan is a senior fertility specialist in Lucknow and she's a dear friend of ours. Uh, and next we have uh, Dr. Savita Agarwal. Dr. Savita is a member of UPSC uh, 2020 and she's, a, she's working at Allahabad and she is the director of Srijan Batsala Hospital. She's also an infertility specialist. Um, next, we have Dr. Kanchan Sharma. Dr. Kanchan is the secretary of Kanpur Obs and Gaini Society, a very active society, and she is a very active secretary over there. It's a privilege to have her with us. And we also have next. Dr. Sumana uh, Guruna. Dr. Sumana was, is an academician par excellence. I have known her personally. We have worked together at Ames, New Delhi, and I know she's a perfectionist to the core. Welcome, Sumana. So with this, we begin with our uh, panel. Can I uh, request the organizer to make me the host so that I can share my screen? Yes, ma'am, I have made you co-host. Thank you. I hope my slides are visible. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So should I start, Priti? Yes, ma'am. So thank you so much. And I think we have already had an excellent talk by Dr. Suchitra Pandit identifying all the issues of obesity. And obesity is a very important aspect. We used to think as is an undernourished country. But estimates show that by 2030, almost 30% 30 of the overweight people will be residing in India. So WHO has also identified obesity as a global epidemic in 1997. It is a systemic disease which affects all the reproduct all the organs of the body, including the reproductive system. And it produces a chronic inflammatory state in the body with increased expression of the pro-inflammatory factors and a reduction in the anti-inflammatory factors. So we quickly move on to our cases. The first case is a Mrs. X, 30 years old, married for three years. She has a BMI of 35 kg per meter squared and has irregular menstrual cycle. She has been trying to conceive since her marriage three years back. She has tried various weight loss regimes and workout schedules, but has failed to lose weight. Her ultrasonography is normal and there are no clinical or biochemical features of hyperandrogenemia. So uh, next slide, Priti, please. Uh, Dr. Kanchan, would you like to discuss the impact of obesity on female fertility? Yes. Uh, first of all, um, my thanks to whole of the team for giving me chance and my regards to uh, Dr. Chandravati ma'am, Dr. Vinita Das and uh, Dr. Uh, whole of the team, Dr. Suchitra Pandit to all the moderators who have given me chance. Um, obesity as just we have heard from uh, uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit that has a um, great effect on fertility. So, because uh, we have seen that these ladies um, uh, who are obese, as in this case, the patient is BMI is more than 35, 35. That is, she is having, uh, uh, she's obese and uh, in female patient, it is seen that 
देर इज डिस्टर्बेंस ऑफ हाइपोथेलमिक पिट्यूटरी को नाइट्रोट्रोपिन एक्सेस इट इज सीन दैट इन दीज पेशेंट देर इज इंक्रीज इन लैप्टिन एंड देर इज रिडक्शन इन फाइब्रोनेक्टिव Uh, that causes actually disturbance in um, uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis because there is it is seen that in these patient there is early follicular atresia delayed meiotic maturation increase aneuploidy and increase follicular apoptosis as uh, you can see very well in this diagram there is stromal decidualization also endometrial receptivity also goes down in these patients because of increase in leptin and tnf alpha uh, there is increased androgens also and estrogen as it is seen that because of uh, um, uh, increase um, uh, in uh, leptins and tnf alpha uh, there are more of androgens and androgens uh, they are change more to the estrogen uh, that process is also there there is reduction in gonadotropins um uh, and uh, there is increase in insulin resistance in this patient and as such there is hyperinsulinemia that may lead to infertility as such um other factors are also there there is reduction in um, shbg and igf and uh, as such total ovulation quality of oocyte that is being affected production and quality of oocyte is also being affected as we in fertility specialists are seeing that and um, ams level naturally that is inversely proportional to bmi so we see that um, ams level we are also finding that usually these patients are having below 2 so uh, and um, so in case these patients reduce their weight these um, uh, per 5 kg of weight loss these parameters they increase uh, very rapidly so uh, weight loss is very important for these patients um, other um, in case we do the infertility treatment of this in these patients even that that also become uh, difficult in these patients uh, because it is seen that uh, uh, if we talk uh, as i have just uh, talked that uh, gonadotropins the requirement is also uh, increased uh, there is less effect of um, uh, even clomiphen and uh, we need a prolonged gonadotropin stimulation and uh, there is lower peak of estradiol levels few and large medium size follicles as such if i monitor in ultrasound ultrasound monitoring is also very difficult because of the fatty fold and as well as there is a reduced vascularity around the follicles so as such there is reduced responsiveness of these obese women to gonadotropin due to the uh, disturbance in volume also the lot many factors which as such in a combined way affect the fertility in these obese patient and even they affect the fertility treatment also so thank you dr kanjan for a very comprehensive reply and we see that obesity is affecting uh, fertility at every level it's affecting ovulation it's affecting the quality of oocytes quality of embryos and it's affecting endometrial receptivity and thereafter it's affecting pregnancy and it's also affecting the treatment of course Thank so you. dr divya would you like to uh, comment is there any effect of obesity on male fertility also yes the obesity does have effect on the male infertility and it has been seen that uh, obese uh, men they have got the lower sperm quality as well as a lower sperm count and motility and there are various factors responsible for it it has been seen with the obesity causes the physical as well as molecular changes in the germ cells so when the germ cells itself is altered then they cause the production of the mature sperm cells is also affected and also because of the adiposity the testosterone uh, like testes the heat level is increased as we all know this uh, level of the this heat is very important for that that also reduces the sperm count motility as well as the uh, morphology and which in turn results into the bad uh, chances of the male infertility and uh, sperm 
it has been seen not only they uh, result into infertility supposingly the uh, we go for the ivf and all they also affect the embryo cleavage and also the pregnancy quality of the pregnancy like the offsprings they are sometimes we see their chances of the this, uh, this uh, small for gestation and age and multiple anomalies they are high because the sperm quality is being affected and also there are chances that these uh, uh, qualities method there are certain uh, epigenetic behavioral changes which occurs and which is transferable to the offspring also and the children th those who are born out of these sperms they can have further reproductive out uh, uh, poor reproductive outcome as well as the metabolic syndrome like diabetes and obesity in the future also so thank you dr divya and uh, very rightly you have pointed out that uh, the effect is not limited to this generation it may pass on to the next generation also so we need to remember that uh, next slide please so uh, dr sumana what are the risks of infertility treatment especially ivf in the obese women Thanks, ma'am. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Smriti and uh, IFSUP chapter for uh, giving me an opportunity to be with you all. So, uh, once we diagnose obesity and the woman needs infertility treatment, so we need to do either ovulation induction or IUIs. So, when we try to induce the patient, we see that obese women respond poorly to clomiphene. In fact, letrozole works better than clomiphene in such women. They need higher doses of clomiphene. And they tend to produce fewer number of follicles and pregnancy rates and live birth rates are lower, both with ovulation induction and with IUI compared to their non obese counterparts. Then coming to gonadotropin induction, they need higher doses of gonadotropins, again produce fewer number of follicles and in turn increases the cost and the difficulty of undergoing the procedure. When it comes to IVF, as uh, ma'am previously mentioned, we see that they require greater gonadotropin doses. The total dose of gonadotropin is higher. They need a longer duration of stimulation. Then they tend to produce lesser number of follicles. The number of M2 oocytes tend to be lower. The fertilization and embryo quality tends to be lower. Their implantation rates are lower because of a probable impact on the endometrial receptivity. Miscarriage rates are higher. And in turn, live birth rates are much lower than the non obese counterparts. And in fact, it is said that for every BMI increase more than 30, there is a 1% to 2% reduction in live birth rate. And if a woman has a BMI of more than 40, she has almost a 50% reduction here in live birth rate. So after this, now supposing we start uh, doing the egg retrievals and the embryo transfers, at the egg retrieval stage, there can be anesthesia complications, difficulty in maintaining an airway, and we discussed about, you know, variatic tables and of proper positioning. And uh, during the pickup, poor visualization because of excessive abdominal fat, accessibility of the ovaries, and in turn complications such as bleeding. And during embryo transfer, poor visualization uh, during embryo transfer because of the abdominal uh, panis. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, this is a little bit. Thank you, Dr. Somana. And definitely, as we have also discussed previously, uh, obesity is affecting every aspect of fertility. And there is a very interesting study by Al Azemi et al., in which they have shown how the rate of ovulation falls from 79% in women with a normal BMI to only 11% in women with BMI equal to more than 35 kg. So our woman is uh, likely to have only 11% of uh, ovulation chances. So we move on to the next question. And uh, Dr. Ekika, if you could take it up, is weight loss uh, recommended before infertility and IVF treatment? Dr. Ekika, you are there? I think if she's, she's not... If she's not there, someone else, anyone can take it up? Yes. Yes, yes. Right. Look, yes we know that uh, it's very important to reduce the weight before going for the infertility and IVF treatment. As we have already discussed, there are so many issues associated with the evolution and for the increased need of the gonadotropins and so many other things, along with the chances of the uh, uh, poor embryo quality as well as poor oocyte quality poor chances of the pregnancy and live birth rate. So it's very important that at least weight reduction should be done prior to the IVF treatment. 
So thank you, Dr. Divya, for taking it up. And definitely it is recommended. Hmm. But again, the flip side is that uh, like this woman, she has been trying to lose weight. She has not yet lost weight. If we keep on trying, we may be allowing her to grow older and further yes. reducing her chances of conception. Yes. So we really need to weigh it. And there are no definite guidelines that you cannot take up IVF in a woman with a higher BMI. Ma'am, can and I just make a point here? Yeah. Sure. So we all know about the negative impact of obesity on fertility and IVF outcomes. So we feel that it's a logical conclusion that since weight loss is something that's reversible, if we can achieve weight loss, then we can actually improve their live birth outcomes. But unfortunately, whatever evidence that we see from literature today, there have been a large number of RCTs that have been done and large cohort studies which have divided people into two arms. In one, they've done some kind of lifestyle intervention tried to achieve at least 5 to 10% weight loss and then proceeded with infertility treatment. And in the second arm, they have done direct infertility treatment. And none of the studies have found an improvement in live birth rates following weight loss. So that's the paradox that we are in today, that though we know that the outcomes are poorer when women are obese, with when weight loss is achieved, we are really not able to demonstrate an improvement in live birth rate with infertility treatment. So that's the unfortunate thing. Yes. Thank you for your input, Dr. Sumana, and definitely that is a problem. So, Dr. Pallavi, what in your opinion are the challenges faced during the IVF procedure? And as such, uh, these patients uh, having high BMI uh, have uh, uh, high leptin, high uh, uh, pro-inflammatory uh, factors, cytokines, TNF-alpha, so right from the start, uh, from the time of induction to, to uh, making the endometrium to uh, picking uh, the oocyte retrievals, giving anesthesia and uh, uh, making them uh, pregnant, like uh, doing the embryo transfers and then uh, waiting for the embryos to grow inside, all these things are always at risk. So it is very important for uh, before trying for an IVF in an obese patient, having a BMI of 35, we should first consider weight reduction <coughs> by ways uh, maybe uh, first to getting them all, giving them all the uh, guidelines regarding weight reduction. And then uh, if if they are not uh, losing weight and the age is, uh, we are seeing that the age is uh, going uh, from their hands. So then in that case, we can go ahead with uh, further like um, some surgical intervention too. So uh, the, in all these patients with high BMI, it is always difficult to do all the IVF procedures. So... Thank you, Dr. Pallavi. Yes, definitely. Uh, though ovum pickup and uh, ED can be performed, many times you may need to go in for an abdominal retrieval. And the main problem arises in the anesthesia because uh, there are greater chances of airway uh, problems. But again, a study shows that it was uh, required in less than 7% of the retrievals. Imaging, again, is a problem in these cases. So now that we have discussed so much about uh, weight reduction, how can we go about it? What are the treatment options? Dr. Sabita, if you could take up the lifestyle modifications. Uh, Dr. Sabita is there. I think connectivity issues, because yes. she was there earlier, I did see yeah. her. Uh, maybe someone else can take it up. Yeah, weight reduction yes. is very important in these patients. Dr. Sapita is there? Yeah, can I take? Yeah, sure. Yeah, weight reduction is very important in these patients because uh, uh, lifestyle intervention that is to be suggested very properly to these patients. For that, um, uh, either you take proper classes, proper uh, demonstration, and they give them a proper literature, tell them about the calorie restriction. That is very important. That 
दे डोंट हैव मतलब उनको भूखे नहीं रहना है सुबह मैं अपने पेशेंट्स को बताती हूँ कि डोंट एक सबसे पहले वो क्या कहेंगे हमने ब्रेड खा लिया ब्रेड में इतना घी डाल के देते एक लाइक सैंडविच तो दैट दैट मेक्स इट आई मैं कहती हूँ सुबह आप स्प्राउटेड खा लो चने भिगो के खा लो लाइक द थिंग्स विच आर लेस कैलोरी लाइक फ्रूट अमरूद खा लिया आप लो ग्लाइसिमिक इंडेक्स वाली चीजें खाएंगे ये अच्छे से उनको एक प्रॉपर डाइटिशियन से काउंसिल करने की बहुत जरूरत है ओनली देन दे विल फॉलो योर इंस्ट्रक्शन डिमोन्स्ट्रेट अगेन एंड अगेन हैमर देम अगेन अगेन ओनली देन दे विल हेयर यू फिजिकल एक्टिविटी बढ़ाने के लिए उनको प्रॉपरली डिमोन्स्ट्रेट करना बिकॉज दीज पेशेंट हु आर ओवर overweight they usually restrict because of their load on the knees and arthritis and other problems wo jaldi uthte bhi nahi hai apni jagah se to unko koi baithe baithe exercise try to move and again again and try to think yourself that i have to exercise myself in any way pranayam yoga join the classes at least they being stimulated at the brain level again again see the videos now lot much of things are available on um, net also for this uh, lifestyle modification pranayam yoga sessions are there so you should be in touch so that you should hammer continuously at your brain level and try to reduce the weight um uh, uh what about uh, anti obesity weight diet and so, that maybe dr somana can take that up anti ah, obesity yeah, sure. yes lifestyle modifications are a very important aspect yes. and we need to bring about a change in her behavior and her thought process for yes. it to be effective yes. so dr somana can you discuss anti obesity medications have you any experience with them Me personally, I have never administered. Probably just orally stat, maybe sometime in the past, but actually no practical experience. But uh, theoretically, so we have drugs that inhibit uh, fat absorption, and we have drugs that uh, reduce the appetite. So drugs that inhibit fat absorption are orally stat, and we have other drugs like uh, fentanyl, topiramate combination, or these newer GLP-1 analogs that is Lira, Glutide, and the others, and uh, naltrexone. so these are some of the other fda approved uh, drugs that are available so of these it is said that uh, the fentanyl topiramate combination produces the maximum amount of weight loss so maybe they produce around uh, maybe around 5 to 10% weight loss and uh, the others probably much lower somewhere between 3 to 6 kgs weight loss so it is said that if we if the lifestyle measures are unsuccessful then adding an anti obesity drug probably will has an add on and may help to enhance the amount of weight loss and add on to the lifestyle interventions that they are doing but it's important that these medications are prescribed by someone who already has experience and knowledge about its adverse effect profile so maybe it's better to leave it to the experts and also we must know that these anti obesity medications are uh, not really safe in uh, pregnancy and in infertility so probably uh, they have to be cautious when they are using it so thank you yes uh, it's very important that we remember these are category x drugs so they are not really very safe for pregnancy so dr palavi is there any role of bariatric surgery and is uh, does it help in uh, fertility Yes, Dr. Pranju. Uh, it is said that uh, initially it was said that for morbid obesity, that is BMI more than forty, uh, one should go ahead with bariatric surgeries. But now uh, the uh, the latest consensus goes to thirty-five. Now that uh, at thirty-five also this uh, can be considered. And uh, for all these procedures, the bariatric surgery, it is said that within one year they lose tremendous amount of weight. Uh, it is. the weight loss is quite high and which helps to maintain first of all the glycemic index their sugar level comes down their insulin resistance improves ovulation uh, improves and uh, uh, they get pregnant by their own also uh, after these surgeries so given an option for a for an age which is to a, to on the higher side 33 34 and with a bmi of 35 to 40 trying to conceive not yet conceived uh, they can opt for uh, bariatric surgery uh, keeping this in mind that they should not get pregnant uh, 
uh, before uh, 12 months to 18 months in between because malabsorption syndromes and everything that changes the milieu and uh, the chances for early fetal demise and IUGR because of high malnutrition component which occurs initially. And uh, uh, so thank you, Dr. Pallavi. And yes, uh, definitely it's an option. But as uh, Dr. Suchitra also emphasized, we need to ask the woman to wait for at least one to two years before she attempts pregnancy after a bariatric surgery because of the risk of nutritional deficiencies. So just a small question, Dr. Ekika, any opinion regarding national BMI cutoffs above which not to offer uh, IVF? Has Dr. Ekika joined? I think she's not there, ma'am. Okay, so anyone? Then I think I, this was what I was speaking about earlier. So the fact that, so there are a lot of believers and uh, non-believers. So the believers feel that since uh, obesity is something that can be reversed, so they better lose weight and then come back for IVF treatment. A lot of uh, public funded IVF don't offer uh, treatment for women who are more than 35 or 40 BMI in some European and uh, uh, other Western countries. But uh, the others argue that uh, since there is no evidence today to say that weight loss is uh, uh, improving live birth rate outcome, why should we deny these women of uh, immediate treatment? So, uh, well, that's the argument. So maybe women probably need to be told that and they need to accept that live birth rates are going to be lower. They're going to make an attempt. If they're unsuccessful, probably they have to understand that their live births is going to be lower and can go ahead with. IVF treatment, understanding the risks. So thank you, Dr. Sumana. And yes, that's uh, very rightly put. And uh, another issue, luckily we don't have any such cutoffs in our country. That too, because probably IVF is not a public funded uh, option in our country generally. And so because people are spending their own money, they are <laughs> allowed to choose as they wish. So just to summarize, lifestyle modification and medical therapy have demonstrated effectiveness in promoting weight loss. Bariatric surgery is an option, but women should avoid conception one year post-operatively. And ovulatory women with obesity improve with weight loss interventions, both for unassisted conception and for assisted conceptions. And weight loss interventions, have not been shown to improve life birth rate, as Dr. Sumana had also emphasized previously. And pre-pregnancy weight loss, weight loss interventions have been shown to improve the outcome of live birth after both non-ART therapy and IVF. We are able to avoid maybe some of the pregnancy complications. And uh, its effect on maternal and fetal complications is not clear. So we have to deal obesity with a lot of uh, sympathy, with a lot of uh, care, counsel them. They should not feel uh, insulted and help them reduce weight by bringing about a change in their lifestyle. So I would also like to request our experts, Dr. Vinita Das and Dr. Minakshi, if they could uh, give the inputs on this case. Thank you, Anju. Uh, our panelists have done a wonderful job. There's nothing more to add. I'll just like to emphasize a few points that whatever adverse factors in terms of ovulation or oocyte maturity or embryo quality or endometrial receptivity and male fertility, whatever it is, it is all well known with the obstetric colleagues and infertility specialists. What we need to do is we have to have a very positive approach with the patients because and it is very important to sensitize them to our patients, keeping in mind with a lot of empathy and uh, not insulting approach, but to sensitize them that what are the adverse effects of this obesity on infertility treatment, on oocyte quality, on embryo quality, and on the strong quality. Because until unless we explain them all these things, 
it will be uh, very difficult once the adverse outcome happens after IVF treatment. Secondly, to emphasize on the diet, what to take, again, we have to have a very positive approach and a counseling is one of the very important factors as Dr. Um, I think Dr. Kanchan has emphasized that we have to tell them practically what is to be eaten, what not to be eaten. So we have to spend some time with the patient, at least half an hour or one hour in understanding their diet and in explaining them what all you are eating amongst this, what is not to be eaten and how with your diet preference you can change your diet pattern. How much calories? So we have to spend about an hour's time with our patient to explain them diet. Again, to explain them exercise, a very simple exercise, we have to tell them for how many minutes, just a simple PT, which we used to do in our um, class fourth and five classes, and just a simple walking, that how much calorie loss they can do. So spending time with these infertility patients, and telling them what will be the positive effect of these. And if they do not follow, what will be the negative impact on their quality of oocyte, on the embryo quality, and on the sperm quality. Probably this might help in changing their behavior and having some positive outcome. Because otherwise, especially in the PCOD patients, there are a lot of follicles. There are a lot of oocytes which you retrieve. But once you grow them in the lab and you end up after retrieving 30 uh, oocytes, when you end up in giving them only two embryos, that two of not good quality, or the males with having a very high DFI and not having good sperm quality, then at that time when you are explaining them why it has happened, it becomes very difficult. So from the very beginning, you have to sensitize them that what are the adverse effects which can happen. And they have we can give them time two to three months. I'm not saying that give them time of about a one year and then you start doing infertility treatment, but sensitize them about the adverse effect, give them time of two to three months so that they can reduce at least two to three or four or maximum five kg. Because to ask them to reduce 15 kg in two months or three months will be an impossible task. So that we can at least improve some quality of their oocytes and embryos and this one. So this is what I just want to say. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your expert inputs. Dr. Minakshi, would you like to add something? <laughs> it's I'm in a pool of experts, I think. First of all, my great gratitude to the organizer to relive my moments with my great teachers like Dr. Chandravati and Dr. Vinita Das, who've been my mentors. So what to say? And great academicians like you and Sunita all are with me. I'm really, you know, thrilled to be with you. But few things I would just add that somebody said, Food is the most abused anxiety drug. So, uh, you know, uh, and exercise is the most underestimated antidepressant. If we can make our patients understand these two things, I think uh, the word, only word comes to my mind is the motivation. So it all needs motivation. So I usually tell my patients, because I am in habit of, abbreviating the disease. So obesity, I have abbreviated like you omit fast foods and cold drinks. Be active throughout the day. Educate yourself not to gain weight. Sleep, have good seven to eight hours, good sleep time. Inculcate workout at least half to one hour. Target ideal BMI for your age and height and say yes to your motivating friends. So oh, wow, <laughs> that's so nice. <laughs> actually abbreviation for obesity for anyone who comes to the clinic. And um, obesity is one thing which is, uh, which usually comes and doesn't go. So motivation at the Minaki time, if we just hit at Minaki, any girl who has to be told that what is her role in life, the God has given us 
the female, the role to become a good mother. But we have allotted the other roles. So when she understands that her major role, what nature has allotted to her, is go through the reproductive cycle. And that reproductive cycle would be good if she has an ideal weight. So if we hit the girls at Minarki, if missed, then definitely one thing which is missing in our country is premarital counseling. Anyone who's going to get married should target, should, should be targeted anyhow. So these are the two things. If we miss at that time, then definitely pre-pregnancy counseling. And again, if she comes to us when she's already obese and facing the issues on infertility, then with smiling face, with motivating factors, we have to abbreviate obesity and motivate them to be with good people, have good lifestyle, eat nutritious food, and if not, then go to infertility specialists like <laughs> IVF specialists. That's what I have to say. So thank, thank you, you so much. A very practical <laughs> advice. And now we move on to another very interesting case discussion. I request Dr. Spriti to take the course. So thank you so much. So uh, a great fertility specialist have now managed to uh, make sure that the patient gets pregnant. So uh, our next case is a 35 year old lady who has conceived spontaneously. Now she's been married for five years and has lost 12 kgs weight and currently her BMI is now much lesser. And she, sorry, she has conceived after two IVF attempts and she's eight weeks pregnant. So I would like to now uh, ask Dr. Kanchan that if a patient gets pregnant after two IVF failures and, you know, uh, with so much of obesity, there are a lot of apprehensions in our mind as to uh, what she should be looking at at her pregnancy. So can you please uh, apprise us the dangers which she will face in her pregnancy? Actually, this is very important that uh, we have to counsel very well to these type of patients because uh, we have to make her understand uh, because obesity is now the major, major cause of all metabolic diseases, non-communicable diseases. And especially in during pregnancy time, obesity may have an effect on mother as well as the baby. The mother has, mother may be having a, a metabolic syndrome. So she may be having hypertension, gestational hypertension. She may go into the preeclampsia. So these things are to be monitored, obesity, um, GDM is very important association with obesity. So um, as such, um, because um, we live in India, so this is a um, ethnic city, uh, ethnic country. So uh, at the first arrival of the patient, glucose mo monitoring, blood sugar monitoring, according to that WHO uh, or Shidur or 75 gram uh, glucose that is to be um, given and tested later on, that is to be done and we can counsel her that the more chances in you as such. So you have to restrict, do the, uh, uh, that is um, uh, monitoring on uh, diet, control your diet, do the exercise, that is MNT, medical nutritional therapy, that is always advised to these patients. These are um, more prone uh, for large in size babies large babies usually uh, there may be because of obesity there may be uh, complications in uh, baby like uh, in many cases uh, they may have even growth retarded babies because of associated preeclampsia and also uh, they are to be well monitored they should be in touch of their doctor for monitoring um, uh, this uh, complication of uh, preeclampsia or um, hypertension and diabetes as such. Um, there may be many malformations as we were discussing, um, uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit has very, very well explained that there may be malfetal malformation. So there may be scanning at the proper time that may be at anti scan should be done a normally scan um, 18 20 uh, 21 weeks that is to be suggested and they should be seen for the proper 
spinal cord uh, because caudal agenesis is a uh, very important in these embryos and uh, patient should be well counseled that uh, you have to be in touch with the uh, doctor because even after uh, during the time of labor uh, it's very difficult to monitor you and bmi if we see that the bmi chart which are there in uh, our labor room we see that uh, in uh, bmi more than 35 the permitted weight gain in uh, during pregnancy is uh, less that is up from uh, only 5 to 7 tension we will be coming to all that yeah, yeah, so yeah. Do, so yeah these are the complications yeah. which are which are to be suggested so uh, as you said most rightly that uh, spontaneous miscarriage the odds are quite high almost double and recurrent miscarriages are also very high in these women and uh, as you have just said that uh, apart from that diabetes is seen very uh, often double with bmi of 30 and more than triple with bmi of over 40 and risk of preeclampsia is also doubled and there is also a very high chance of preterm labor so overall we are looking at a very complicated pregnancy even when they go into labor they have a dysfunctional labor increased operative delivery shoulder dystocias and even the postpartum periods are full of complications like wound infection, dehiscence, and PPH and deep venous thrombosis. So overall, the women would definitely have, a, if um, uh, when they get pregnant with increased weight, a lot of maternal risks. So um, now Dr. Divya, maybe you can take it up uh, that apart from maternal risks, we have been talking about stillbirths and we have been talking about, can you just summarize uh, what are the various infant and perinatal complications yes. we see in uh, pregnant women with obesity? Yeah, not only with the maternal risk, we can see there are increased uh, chances of the uh, neonatal as well as the perinatal complications. And if, like uh, there, we have already discussed, there are increased chances of the congenital anomalies. Most of probably is associated with the hypersinemia and the insulin resistance. There are chances of the increased chances of the congenital anomalies. Along with it, we see. There are the chances for the uh, adiposity, as we have discussed. There are chances of the macrosomia resulting into the difficult delivery, shoulder dystocia. And there are also chances of the stillbirth. Sometimes it is very unexplained stillbirth. We cannot find the cause. And the most probably it is also associated with diabetes, chances of the stillbirth. Other, it increases the neonatal morbidity as well as mortality. Chances of the premature labor is also, uh, is also there. So these are the factors which are associated with the obesity, which has to be taken or care of, and they has to it has to be counselled to the patient beforehand that we have to be prepared for all these things, and we have to be very cautious regarding all these factors. Yes, Dr. Divya, very rightly said. So overall, there are many perinatal complications which can happen, and as you also said that uh, the infants born to the women who are obese are also end up having obesity. So yeah. we know that obesity begets obesity. And it is a vicious cycle because if a woman has increased weight, the babies are born obese and then this cycle just continues. Um, okay, we've done that. So uh, as you said that the counseling, we need to tell her about the medical risk factors, the operative deliveries, and also about the perinatal risk factors which a woman will experience. Hmm. So um, what are the recommendations for maternal weight gain during pregnancy? Yeah, you're ask, uh, we have to tell about the all or we have to tell Just about tell the us about the obesity and the overweight. Really. Yeah, it has uh, normally the weight gain which is recommended in the normal pregnant patient is around, around up to 11, 12 kg. But in cases of the obese patients, it has been recommended. It is around 6 to 7 uh, kg per body weight, uh, 6 to 7 kg weight gain should be there. And uh, but sometimes the patient also go for the weight loss also, and it is also sometimes helpful. And the exercise is also recommended in cases of the obese patient, which helps to uh, that they should not be much weight gain as well as also sometimes even a smaller weight loss is also beneficial for the fetal growth as well as reducing the yes, maternal risk. Very true. So the earlier myth which used to be there that women should not lose weight in pregnancy does not hold true for the obese and yeah. overweight women because yeah. they should continue to do that. And uh, as we know that by 2030, probably we will have 30% all, all overweights in the world would be Indians. And that's a very alarming figure. So Dr. Sumana, uh, as we were talking about the weight loss and the exercise regimes, what aerobic exercises do you recommend that pregnant women can undergo? Because they're very fearful because they're worried that they will have a miscarriage or, you know, some kind of a complications. So what should we advise them? What exercises can they have? 
So basically, pregnant, obese pregnant women should be counseled that aerobic activity is safe during pregnancy. It does not have increased risks of uh, preterm births, miscarriages, or even low birth weights and things like that. But it's very important that they do two things. So one is they must do it under supervision. So they, they must not suddenly start exercising if they've never exercised before. And it must be done under the supervision of probably a physiotherapist. And third is they must know when not to exercise. So any high risk pregnancy where there can be, you know, uh, uh, she's had a surclage or there is previous history of preterm or it's a precious IV pregnancy, as in this case, she has to be a little careful. And or if there is preeclampsia or multiple pregnancy. So, so in all these cases, they have to be a little careful. So the aerobic activities that can be done are uh, brisk walking, maybe stationary cycling, swimming, uh, prenatal yoga, low impact uh, uh, aerobic activities, uh, maybe low impact uh, Pilates. So all these things are safe. So normally the ACOG recommends around 150 minutes per week of uh, exercise for normal pregnant women. But for obese women, uh, there are no specific guidelines or recommendations in terms of minutes. So if the woman has never exercised earlier, she has to go slow. She has to listen to her body, start with five or 10 minutes every day and gradually increase it based on her stamina. So she also has to know when to stop. So if she gets too breathless or uh, if she gets dizzy or if the peak heart rate should never go beyond 70%. So these are uh, situations where she should uh, take, she should just stop. So uh, one very important thing is to take the talk test. That is, if a woman while exercising is not able to talk, so that means then now she has to slow down and not probably do that much of activity. It's very rightly said. So the fear which women have, if we counsel them appropriately, probably they will succeed in you know controlling their weight gain in pregnancy. And the exercises which a pregnant woman should not do, this also we need to tell them because whenever they have a risk of falling, uh, or playing, you know, for example, while playing games like soccer or basketball, that should be avoided. And scuba diving also should be avoided. And they should also be uh, careful, especially when they're exercising at a high altitude. So, um, uh, Dr. Pallavi maybe can take up this, that we were talking about anti-obesity medications uh, uh, in uh, non-pregnant women. But what about if a pregnant woman is advised anti-obesity medications or maybe she's taking them inadvertently because she has been asked to lose weight. So uh, what, what is the effect of these medications if she has taken them? Dr. Pallavi? Uh, I think no anti-obesity medication is safe in pregnancy. They are all categorized in category X. And uh, if uh, she has been taking and she got pregnant, so that uh, becomes a very uh, dicey case because uh, in that case, uh, though... Uh, in our case, where she went for an IVF and she conceived, I think she might well be counseled and this patient might not be taking anti-obesity drugs. But uh, if she is taking and she's conceived naturally, yes, we will have to counsel that this is a category X drug and we don't know what would be the consequence. And this totally depends on the parent's choice, whether to continue or not to continue. And then accordingly, we'll move further as per the patient's will keeping this in mind that whatever uh, has to be seen as per the gestational ages should be seen uh, accordingly. Yeah, and for our uh, delegates, we, I would like to tell them about this uh, large study which was uh, done by the Swedish Medical Birth Register uh, over a period of approximately 13-14 years. And there they found that there were 500 women who were exposed to the anti-obesity medications. However, there was no increase in the major malformation risk, especially with the Olistat. But cybitramine was found to have an increased cardiovascular defects. And this was probably because of long QT time. A lot of times what happens is that these women are not probably taking an anti-obesity medication per se, but they're taking some kind of a formula available on the internet for weight loss. And that probably has this drug. And this is what they need to actually look at, that they can actually, uh, this can lead to malformations. So, Dr. Pallavi, another question that if a woman has, take, has had a bariatric surgery, uh, can she actually now be safe or are there any effects on maternal and perinatal outcome in the long run? Uh, I think uh, bariatric surgery is at present by the surgeons considered to be a very good way to reduce weight. Uh, though 
if uh, the patient has conceived within these 12 months of the bariatric surgery, major malnutritional uh, changes will be seen in the mother, followed by in the fetus, leading to uh, IUGR and uh, 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 major, major macronutrient and micronutrient deficiencies in the mother as well. So we have to see that uh, post bariatric surgery, the and uh, it is said very common deficiency is the B1 deficiency, followed by all the calcium, iron, uh, folic acid, B12. And uh, so in that case, we should uh, counsel the patient not to get pregnant. And if she gets, then there are chances of IUGR. Yes, very very many, like you said. Much chances of IUGR. And... Uh, um, Dr. Kanchan, uh, yeah. now if the woman delivers, and but she still has certain postpartum challenges. For example, we were talking about uh, the postpartum weight retention. So what can she do to overcome them? Because um, these patients are overweight, so always we should remind them that um, uh, now is the time that you have to be watchful uh, for certain things. First of all, diet, she has to be um, uh, very careful. She has to look after many other things like uh, PPH, etc. That depends on ki, um, what was the mode of delivery that was uh, there. And um, she has to have a good uh, nutritional uh, nutritionist who will suggest her how to take the uh, diet which will uh, fulfill her requirement also and um, adjust the caloric uh, management also. So uh, low calorie but high nutritional uh, diet should be suggested. And she should also be told about to continue exercising because it Exercise. is seen that, yes, that yeah. I am coming to that point okay. that nutritionist as well as physiotherapist is uh, very important under the proper guidance. She should she should exercise post delivery. That is um, uh, that depends whether uh, her delivery was by the cesarean or by the vaginal. So keeping in uh, mind, they should be ex uh, advised proper exercise. There are certain type of exercise, maybe ball exercise, maybe few type of uh, yoga. They should be under proper guidance. Stretching exercises should be avoided unless the incision has been healed. So yeah. pelvic floor exercises may be uh, recommended in the immediate postpartum period, many type to reduce the risk of uh, future urinary incontinence. This is important. Many things has to be kept in mind. And the literature suggests that uh, lactation, during lactation, reduction of daily energy intake as long as at least um, 1800 kilocalorie per day are maintained and exercise and weight loss uh, are compatible even in the overweight or obese women. So that should be kept in mind. So the women should take the most of this opportunity and continue to lose weight. So yeah. we would just uh, thank you so much panelists and we would now conclude by saying that a woman of obese women uh, faces problem right from the beginning. She faces difficulty in conception. And after she conceives also, there are hundreds of problems which are looking at her. But we all know that some of them with good supervision also have a very good maternal and fetal outcome. Postpartum weight retention is a very important thing which we must counsel them because if they're able to reduce the weight, they will actually be able to save themselves from a lot of metabolic problems which will happen later. So uh, with this, we come to the conclusion. So we know that the postpartum cardiovascular risk assessment and follow-up, this area still remains very under-recognized and we must continue to counsel our women and do further research to know how we can actually help these women in their later lives also. So thank you so much. And we all now do understand that now it's time to change the conversation about obesity and pregnancy and tell them all the things which they can do, continue to help them exercise, give them dietary modifications and help them lose the weight in some form or the other. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice moderation, both Smriti and Dr. Anju. Thank you, Dr. Anju and Dr. Smriti for such a panel. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Anju. Thank you, Smriti. It was really lovely. And uh, we do not want to add anything extra. You have very exhaustively explained all the details and everything about how to deal with pregnancy and obesity.
So thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Very thank nice. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, respected moderators, experts, and our panelists. Indeed, it was a really interactive session. With this, we have come to the end of our scientific session, and it was really wonderful experience to be part of this program, this first master class on medical disorders in ART pregnancies. Uh, I would like to extend my gratitude to the organizer, Dr. Manjusha Madam, and Anju Ma'am for giving me opportunity to be part of this program. Next, I want to express my gratitude to Professor Chandravati Madam, who gave her valuable time and graced the, uh, this occasion as guest of honor. Thank you, ma'am. I would like to thank our experts, Professor Vinita Das, madam, Dr. Minakshi Sood, madam, speaker, uh, Dr. Suchitra Pandit, madam, uh, panel moderators, Prof Professor Anju Agwal, ma'am, Dr. Smriti, ma'am, chairperson, Sadhna, ma'am, Sunita Chandra, ma'am, and Dr. Uma Pande, ma'am, and our dynamic panelists. I would like to thank our senior members from the society who, who took time to join us. I would also like to thank the August audience for attending, attending this program and making it successful. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And thank we would like to that. thank Shield Healthcare for their support uh, in providing the pl platform. Of course, of course, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mona, thank you so you. lovely, so much, lovely. Thank, thank you so you, much, Mona. You conducted it so seamlessly. And uh, uh, Smriti and Anjuji, I have no words for you. Thank you so much for agreeing to moderate this panel. But for you, we would not have been here and doing so well. And thank you, Vinita Das, ma'am. Thank you, Minakshi Sud, ma'am. Gita Khanna, ma'am. Thank you, everybody from the bottom of my heart. It really, really was an awesome, awesome um, interaction. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Manjusha. Thank you, Manjusha. Thank you. you did a wonderful job. The first, uh, thank you, uh, this thank arrangement you. was very, very successful. And uh, you did it with full of your heart, full heartedly effort. Comment your back. Congratulations, Dr. Madhusha and your team. Ah, yes, Madhusha. And I must thank Dr. Sunita Chandra and Dr. Um, Gita Khanna and Dr. Renu Makkar and Dr. Vinita Das, ma'am, uh, for their valuable advice and uh, support, and Dr. Chandravati, ma'am, for the very idea of doing this. I mean, but for these tall words and their valuable advices, uh, we can't really achieve anything, nothing. Thank you all. Thank you. All the best, Madhusha, for the future. Yes. Thank you. Keep on Thank organizing you. such wonderful webinars. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Congratulations, ma'am. And thank you. Congratulations to you, Mona. You were so well. So so good.